now started. Good evening, Simon. It's good to see you again. Good evening, Stephen. Nice to a see you. Has, a lot has happened since we uh, we last chatted. I'm looking forward to, to going through it. Uh, but I think first, if you could uh, describe uh, a sort of short recap of uh, our first interview, which, which brought it up to about 1900, didn't it? Yeah, um, in the last interview, we, we get, went through really the, the foundation of Catalonia as an independent state um, around the county of Barcelona, how it became um, a massive uh, Mediterranean empire that included mm -hmm. Catalonia, Aragon, Valencia, the Balearic Islands, Sicily, Corsica, Sardinia, Naples, even um, the Parthenon in Athens for 18 wow. years was known as the Seo de Santa Maria. So the, the Catalans, or the, the, this was when it was called the Crown of Aragon, um, but the, the capital was effectively Barcelona. It had twin capitals, Barcelona and Zaragoza, but Barcelona was effectively the, the capital because it was a port. Um, right. But but there were there were various associated um, territories, and this is the real period of, of historical glory of the Catalans. And one of the one of the reasons why the Catalans always claim they have a right to independence is because they were a great nation a thousand years ago. Um, another interesting thing about the Catalans: um, it's one of the countries with the oldest democratic set of democratic institutions in Europe. Um, the Usachas de Barcelona, which is the first proto-democratic um, document, predates the Magna Carta by 60 years. Hmm. Um, um, in 1353-59, I, I think the, the Generalitat de Catalunya dates from then, um, which at that time the British Parliament hadn't really developed into much more than the Star Chamber. I'm not, um, but Catalonia politi Catalan political institutions go back a very long way so it's a very very interesting place in my case to write about the history is very interesting and also its current affairs are very in interesting the important thing that happened out afterwards is is in 1714 um or various various through various di dynastic marriages um principally the catholic kings in in 1469 i think it was isabel and ferdinand isabel of castile and, and ferdinand of aragon married and united the crowns of aragon and castile right there were still two separate countries effectively then until 1714 when spain or the, the various spanish territories were left without heir and there was a dispute over who was going to um, accept the, the crown of the Spanish Empire, as it was beginning to be called. It wasn't Spain yet. Uh, and the Catalans backed uh, Charles III of, uh, Charles Has Habsburg of Austria, mm -hmm. uh, who, and called him Charles III of, of Catalonia, uh, of Aragon. And the Castilians backed uh, Philip of Anjou, who was the grandson of Louis XIV. And this led to a massive European war because the British and the Dutch in particular didn't want a Franco-Spanish alliance. So they joined the, the War of the Spanish Succession on the Catalan side. Mm -hmm. And it, it was uh, so it's basically France and Spain against Catalonia and the rest of the Arag Crown of Aragon, uh, Britain and Holland. Unfortunately, in 1712, um, Charles of Habsburg inherited the throne of the um, Holy Roman Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Allies thought, well, we don't want a massive, we don't want um, the Austri Austrians getting control of Spain either. either. Right. So, the, so the British and Dutch pulled out, and the, and the British pulled out in, uh, and got Gibraltar in return and Menorca. And so, so the long-standing dispute with Spain over Gibraltar dates back to that period. It's still going, isn't it? Yes, and, and it will go on forever, <laughs> I think. Um, yeah. Being Catalan, I'm kind of pro-Gibraltar, um, but right. you know, that's, just, that's just to mix it with, with the Spaniards. Um, yeah, where were we? That's 1712. Um, Catal well, the Crown of Aragon, or Catalonia and the Balearic Islands in particular, Valencia and Aragon had already fallen by then, were left on their own fighting this massive Franco-Spanish army. Um, and in 
in seven, yeah, uh, a 13 month siege took place outside Barcelona when the population of the city was probably only 30, 40,000. There were 45,000 Franco Spanish troops outside Barcelona and the siege lasted for 13 months and Barcelona fell on September the 11th, 1714. And the reason why we have these massive demonstrations with 1.5 million people on the streets is because our national day, the Catalan national day, is to commemorate the day when all Catalans' charters, laws, rights, ins institutions were abolished because it was a, because Catalonia was effectively annexed by the, the, the yeah. Castilian crown. And this, another is one, one that, and Spaniards or people, people have a different takes on history, and this can be argued, but one of the Catalan arguments is that um, Catalonia didn't become part of Spain voluntarily, it was annexed, conquered effectively. And it was from that point on that, that the Catalan language was first, um, not fully made illegal, but made unofficial. So, so all business, all government, all law was done in Spanish. Um, the, the next thing the, the, the Castilians did was close down all the universities. Uh, the, the theory being that an un, uneducated people were difficult to, were easy to, to subjugate. And then, really, what, what happens next? Yeah, I want to, I'm, I know I'm, this is becoming a rather long monologue, um, but the recuperation of Catalonia following its fall is very important because th three things happen. What, what I said to you, we talk about, we talk about the rise of political cap capitalism, which is the, the backstory to the current, um, to the current independence debate. Um, yeah. But hopefully I've shown that Catalonia goes back a very long way, more than a thousand years. And its recuperation in the 18th and early 19th centuries began first economically. Um, fire water, I, 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 the, our then, uh, Catalonia had very poor quality wine. Uh, and what they did, decided to do is, is distill it into brandy. And mm -hmm. they exported this to the United States. Um, right. or, or the Americas, not the United States, the Americas. And so when you talk here in these Indians on cowboy films talking about fire water, what they're actually, it's ag aguarden, which in Catalonia, Catalan means fire water. So they're talking about Catalan brandy. And the Catalan industry began to recuperate after a hundred years. And intelligently people began investing in, the, in textiles. Um, mm -hmm. And at first it was just printing textiles. Um, calico, the calico fields are very famous outside Barcelona, Sant Andreu, where I used to live. Um, because there, wherever there was water, you could print textiles and then they could be re-exported. Mm -hmm. Once that happened, Catalonia started producing its own textiles and importing cotton. So by the mid 19th century, um, Cat Catalonia or Barcelona was known as the Manchester of the Mediterranean. Um, right. Because, because okay. yep. it, after, the, after the United States and Lancashire, it was the biggest textile uh, producer and exporter in, in Europe or in the, in the Western world. Then the next thing happened is, is something that is known as the Renascenza, which is, which is a culturally, cultural and literary renaissance. I mean, these, these things are actually coincide in time. And people started speaking Catalan again after 150 years of, of it effectively being banned. And particularly when the middle classes start using the language, then it becomes a, a, a language of prestige. Um, yes. so, something I've always talked about is, is Cat Catalan isn't a minus, minority language. It's a stateless language. Well, not completely stateless even because they speak it and, in Andorra. But, but um, Catalonia isn't it's a separate state. Um, but it's always managed to be, or certainly all the time I've been here, a language of prestige because it's spoken by the middle classes. And once the, once the business classes uh, took Catalan on board, it was only a question of time. Be they had the industry, they had the language, they had the literature, they had the culture. It's not, it, it was only a question of time before the political demands started coming together and the Catalans said, well, we've got all this. We're a different culture and we've got our own industries and Spain hadn't gone through the Industrial Revolution at the time. Um, OK, we want a different political system. And that's pretty much where we got up to last time. Right. Indeed. Now, uh, if we're picking up in the, in the 19th century, 
And, and the, I was amazed to, to read that at the end of the 19th century, Spain went to war. And Spain went to war with the United States. Yes, very stupidly, very, in a very foolhardy fashion. It's interesting to think that um, it's only really post -World, World War I where the European great powers started taking the United States seriously. I mean, everybody knew, um, but it was a rather arrogant war, um, principally over Cuba. Uh, and in 1898, um, Basically, the United States took Cuba off Spain, and this caused this caused a, a crisis of confidence in 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 in, in Spanish politics and literature. The, there's a great um, there's a, there are a number of writers known as the Generation of 98, 98 who and this is Spanish writers who write about um, how Spain has fallen fall on hard moral times, and Spain itself after that is picking itself up. The Catalans, on, uh, on the contrary, the Catalans decided, well, this is a time supposed to be separate. Spain has failed us because Catalan, Catalonia, Catalonia had a lot of business deals with Cuba. And this, this provoked great tensions between Barcelona and Madrid um, at the turn of the 19th century. Or the, at the turn of the 20th century, sorry. No. I just, just for those who are listening, the, the country is actually governed from Madrid. Yes. Mm. Yeah, and that's that's the centre of power. And uh, whilst Bar Barcelona is the, the centre of uh, Catalonia. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, just going to my my crib sheet. My apologies for this, because uh, I'm just going to uh, check that. Uh, the, and then in 1913, they set up the Catalan Catalonian Assembly. Um, it wasn't a Catalonian Assembly. Um, okay, this push for power, I mean, it wasn't a push for independence then. Um, in fact, the main conservative party at the time was called the La Liga Regionalista, the Regionalist League. And it was, it was pushing for more autonomy. And it was actually, it was in 1914, it set up what was known as the Man Comunitat, which can loosely be tra translated as the, as the Catalan Commonwealth. After pushing Madrid, the government in Madrid, quite a lot for about a decade, actually, <clears throat> um, the Catalans or the Catalans managed to get through a law where different pro provinces could group together how they like liked. And Catalonia in 17, or actually in 1833, had been split up into four rather unnatural prov provinces: the province of Barcelona, the province of Girona the province of Tarragona and the province of Lleida. And they cover what was traditionally well, Catal Catalonia back in at this time, the autonomous communities of Andalusia and Castile and Catalonia and the Basque country didn't exist. Um, Spain was divided into rather small provinces. And the Catalans managed to get through a law that allowed um, provinces to group together in order to make government more efficient. So the four provinces grouped together without any more, um, they had no more powers, but, but they grouped together as the Man Comunitat or Commonwealth of Catalon Catalonia in 1914. And Enrique Prat de la Riba, um, who's a very legendary and very important early political leader, was the president of, of this organization. And... Where where Spain was very very backward, it hadn't gone through the industrial re revolution. It was still effectively feudal. Um, the Catalans in, in, in introduced modern health systems, or or modern for the time, health systems, education systems. Um, it normalised the language. Um, there were departments of energy, road, water, telecommunications, um, because the telephone was coming coming in at the time. So, so Catal Catalonia was way ahead um, in terms of in infrastructures of the rest of Spain. And um, yeah, the, the, the paths of, or the, the, the way the two parts of the, of the Iberian Peninsula are organized have been different for a very long time. This independence claim is nothing new. It's deeply rooted. Right. In, indeed. Um, and uh, the, the Sort of next, uh, I'm going to get this wrong. I know I'm going to get it wrong, but I'm going to try. <laughs> and then you we, need to, you we need to ask the questions, otherwise, it's a monologue. So, no, 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 I'm, I'm trying my best 
Uh, but it, we, if we come from, from 1914 up to 1923, yeah. and uh, Miguel Primo de Rivera, yeah. and the language, what happened then when he came to power? Um, okay, M Miguel Primo de, de, de Rivera was the f effectively, well, legend has it that he was the first Spanish fascist dictator of the 20th century. But actually in Spain, um, power had changed by what was known as pronunciamientos. Um, the military had taken power many times throughout the, the 19th century. Um, so you can see Miguel Primo de Rivera as just, a, it was just another military coup. So it's, a, right. it's, it's one of many military coups in the, in the previous hundred years, but he's also the precursor to Franco because it's 20th century. And I mean, it's, it's, it's a proto-fascism that's, that's coming along before Mussolini, before Hitler. And it's all about the unity of the state. Um, everybody's got to speak the same language, the church. Um, they were all, all, always very strong on the, the, the Catholic church. Uh, and, and basically, Miguel Primo de Rivera, he was dictator for, for the whole of Spain, um, but um, banned the, or, or, or closed down the, the Catalan Commonwealth, the Catalan Mancomunitat. And there were six, seven, it was a period, very dark period for the whole of Spain, actually. And, and then in 19, he died in 1929, 1930, I think, and the king, um, Alphonse, Alfonso the Thirteenth, who had been, who had allowed a, a dictator to take control of the country, tried to put more puppet, puppets on the on the throne, uh, and or, or in power, not on the throne. Um, and then in 1931, in the municipal elections of 1931, all the Republican parties won. Actually, it's interesting; they didn't w win the whole elections. It was, I think, it's in April 1931. But they won in all the major cities, and the fact that the Republicans had won in all the this is Madrid, Seville, Barcelona, Bilbao, Valencia they they got control of all the all the centers of power, and this forced the the king. I'm not sure whether he abdicated, um, but he definitely left the country. He was forced to flee right. the country, and that's when the the Second Republic began, um, which was in 1931 to 1936. Uh, there were various republican um, governments um, that were more or less left and have, have been very idealized by the British law, the rest in the rest of Europe, um, because, because it was the people governing themselves effectively. It, they, they've been a little over idealized. And in 1931, um, okay, as the, the, the republic was declared, um, Catalonia kind of declared independence. It declared itself a, a separate republic within the Iberian Federation. And then declared independence again in 1934, after which the Catalan president, Luis Companys, was arrested because a right-wing government had taken control of Madrid. Then they were thrown out. Um, Luis Companys came, came out of prison. Uh, there was a left-wing popular front for the last year of the republic. And then Franco uh, came from Morocco and the Spanish Civil War began. What people often forget about Franco is Franco, this was another coup because the, the Republican government was the legal government of Spain in 1936. And Franco and the generals um, decided that they weren't having any of this socialism going on and republicanism going on. So they were going to take control of the country again. And that was in June, July 1936. And that they, they then, uh, what happened in Catalonia after 1936 and, and the war especially? Well, uh, the war, Catalonia is famous because of um, George Orwell's, I, I strongly re recommend everybody to read George Orwell's Homage to Catalonia. It's a fantastic book and I read it when I, and it's about his time in the, in the, here in the Civil War. And one of the reasons why most British people think that the civil war took place mainly in Barcelona and Barcelona held out much more than anybody else. It's partly due to um, Orwell's book and Ken Loach's film, Land and Freedom, um, which bo both cover the, the Catalan um, campaign. Um, obviously the, the Catalan stood out against Franco, but it mustn't be, uh, mustn't be forgotten that Madrid actually stood out for longer. 
um, held out for longer. Um, but effectively, once um, I think it's in January 1939, uh, once Barcelona fell, to all intents and purposes, the, the Spanish Civil War, War was over. There'd been a long, long battle of the, the Ebro. Another reason why the, the British are very passionate about the Sp Spanish Civil War in Catalonia is there was a there were a lot of international brigadiers here, uh, and mm -hmm. and so there there were very very strong lo links between the Catalan uh, the Catalan left and the Independent Labour Party in in Britain who were the main organisers of the International Brigade. I'm I'm no expert on this. I have a friend, um, uh, what's his name, Nick. I'll I'll put in put on the on the on the feed a, a friend of mine has just written a book about about this an excellent book about um, the Spanish Civil War in Barcelona okay Barcelona yeah. fell and in April interestingly on April the 1st April Fool's Day 1939 um, Franco had co had conquered the whole of Spain got control of the whole of Spain and he announced that there would effectively be peace in our times um, that he got control of the country, and repression began in Catalonia. Um, many were, hundreds were executed. Uh, hundreds of republicans were executed all over Catalonia, particularly on the mountain of Montjuic outside Barcelona. Many, many fled into exile. There were terrible stories of refugee camps on the French-Spanish borders, much the same as happens to Syrians now. Um, mm. the, the conditions were terrible. The, France couldn't cope and wasn't particularly interested in coping with so many Cat Catalan and, and other Spanish re re refugees who were escaping from, from fascism, basically. Uh, and many fle fled, to, fled abroad. I've got um, friends or friends who are here now who many, many of my friends were actually born in England. Uh, because they were born to exile, exiled parents and have come back since the return of democracy. Uh, what the, so the we're, talking about, we're talking about a flight of about two over two hundred thousand people. Aren't we? Yes, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is a major, a major exodus, and they went all over the world. Um, the Catalan language was banned once again. It was effectively made. I mean, it was. For the first few years, it was all you could almost be arrested for speaking Catalan, and after that, it wasn't a very, very good idea. Um, in my book, I, I mentioned my father-in-law, um, my ex-father-in-law. Um, very, very rare. He used to speak Catalan at home, and this was in the 1990s, and it was it's kind of learned behaviour. But almost always spoke Spanish in the street, and I always figured that this. He, he, he was just keeping his no, nose clean. This was just in case. And I think what, what happened is the Catalan language just went underground, effectively. It wasn't as illegal as some people claim, but it was definitely frowned upon. And one of the important events, events that happened was in 1940, um, the Catalan president, Luis Companys, had fled to France, actually fled to Brittany, and he was caught by the German Gestapo and returned to Catalonia. Uh, and executed by a firing squad by, uh, on Montjuic. And I'm not sure, I don't want to make some, some exaggerated claim, but I, I think he's, he's perhaps the only um, acting um, head of state, because you remember that, that Catalonia had declared itself independent, um, who was actually executed. Uh, and one of the interesting things is that the Germans and the French have apologized this, uh, for, uh, have apologized uh, to the Catalans for this, but the Spanish never have. So technically, uh, a, president, a president caught and murdered by fascists is still uh, a war criminal, which we find slightly annoying here. Uh, he, 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 he's exactly. exonerated. So it was a time of repression, the language was banned, and the culture of goat goes underground. Um, and that's still the case after the, after the end of the war, isn't it? Oh yes, uh, completely. There were there were various um, re rebel movements. There was a great, um, a rather romantic rebel movement called the Maquis, um, who tried to invade Spain and actually took over a large part of the Bayderan in in the Pyrenees, uh, and right. invited the French, uh, invited the the Allies 
to c come in and, and help them. One of, the, one of the terrible things about Catalonia, the, the English have got, or the British have got a lot to answer for. They let the Catalans down in 1714 and didn't help Spain out really um, before the start of the Second World War. And towards the end of the Second World War, um, everybody in Spain was really hoping that the Allies would come in. You know, they were liberating France. Mm -hmm. They never yeah. came to liberate, uh, liberate Spain because Franco had rather cleverly, um, he'd wanted to ally with, with the Nazis and with Hitler and Mussolini and, and in, in fact had um, the famous Guernica painting by Picasso um, is about the, the Nazi bombing of the Basque country. Uh, he, and Mussolini bombed Catalonia as well. Um, but he actually never formally joined um, the, the, Axis, the Axis alliance. Um, so when the Second World War finished, um, the, the Allies never came to, to help the Spanish Republicans out, the Spanish Democrats out, and um, Franco remained in power, which was very upsetting. Uh, but mm. what, and then, then what Franco did up until 1945, the, the regime had, had been, um, ideologically been dominated by the Falange, which is effectively a fascist party. From 1945 onwards, the regime's ideology became known as national Catholicism. Uh, and right. so it was, but, but basically it was the same thing. Yeah. Um, right. I think, uh, Right. Okay. If we just take a take a, a breather for a moment, and uh, we've got a couple of questions, uh, and I'll bring one of those questions across. Okay. Okay. So this question is from Thomas Lynn. Can you comment upon what relationships, if any, obtain between Catalonia and such currents as left anarchism and communism? Well, the, the left anarchism and communism is is has been a fundamental part to. Catalan politics for, yeah, at, at the turn of the 19th century, um, anarchism and, and, and com communism were the working class answer to conservative Catalanism. And so anarchism and communism um, are, form very much part of the political scene. Um, interestingly, and yeah, one of the reasons why Miguel Primo de Rivera came to power was the Catalan conservatives um, faced with um, anarchist and, and socialist unrest in the major cities and industrial centers in Catalonia, effectively handed over power to Miguel Primo de Rivera, the first dictator. Many times the Catalan conservatives have collaborated with the regime because there was such a, a strong anarchist tendency. In the Civil War, I mean, everybody will have heard of um, Duruti, um, the famous anarchist leader, leader but um, parties like the FI, the Federation Anarchista Internacional, um, and various Trotskyist, small Trotskyist parties. Orwell, for example, was a, a member of the POM, the, the Parti, Partido Obrero Unifica, de Unificación Marxista. I can't translate that, um, but this was a Trotskyist. <laughs> this was a Trotskyist party, um, mm -hmm. and at the start of the Civil War. Um, Catalonia is one of the few places of the world, if not I'm not the only, I think, where anarchists were actually in government. Because when the Catalans took, formed the resistance to, to Franco's troops, and because the, 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 the Spanish military had come in and tried to take the city, everybody had to band together, the workers had to be armed. Um, so anarchists and the far left had to be in government along with the relatively conservative Catalans, um, and I'm not sure whether this has happened anywhere else in the world. And it's very interesting, moving on right now, to, right up to the present, um, yeah. the current fight with or, or disagreement between Junts Pol C, the Together for Yes coalition, um, that is that won the elections, and the COUP, which is the um, popular, popular unity candidacy, it, which is very um, far left, and they might not like me saying so, but I know a few uh, anarchists who are members of the party. But these far left and anarchist tendencies still exist. They're, they're part of um, the, the political subculture culture in Catalonia and I just aren't going to go away. In fact, one of my 
long-term projects is one day to write a history of of you know the Catalan Cat, Catalan radical politics, radical politics in Catalonia or or in Barcelona in particular, and call it uh, Barcelona Rose of Fire, because Barcelona has many nicknames. One is the Great Enchantress, but for its violent uprisings, particularly in the first two decades of the 20th century, the, the tragic week, uh, it became known as the Rosa del, del Foc, the Rose of Fire, uh, because it has a, you know, when the, when the Catalans rise up, they rise up big style, or they used to. We've become very peaceful and have these nice civic demonstrations now. But there's a, there's a, there's a strong anarchist undercurrent. Uh, understood. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you for the question, and uh, hopefully uh, it's been fully tackled by uh, Simon. And I'm just yeah, going to yes, I, I, one. I see, see that the question. Yeah. Um. Quick, quixotico, um, Tom. Um, I'm not a massive expert on this, and and you say that the analogues were with the Paris communes. They might well be, um, but I know a lot about. Um, Catalan history, history, and a, and a lot more about Spanish history, and this is something I'd need to investigate. Let's hope that answers a bit better. Right. Okay. So we've we've got the uh, situation where Franco is still in power, and we're after the war, and we're coming up to uh, to 1951, and there is a tram strike, which is a catalyst yeah. for uh, a lot of uh, activity. Well, the, the trans, the, the, this is one of these legend, legendary moments. That there wasn't as much follow, follow up to it as people would like to think. But it, it, effectively, the tram strike in Barcelona was the, the, the last battle won by the, the generation that lost the Civil War. This is how I describe it in my book. And what happened, it seems these things often come out of something quite petty, is they decided to raise tram fares in Barcelona making them proportionally much higher than in Madrid. So working class people decided, it wasn't a strike, it was, it was a tram boycott. They decided to, to boycott using, using the trams. And Franco wanted to send the troops in, but the civil, uh, the civil governor said, well, you, you can't really shoot people for not using trams, can you? You can't, no. can't shoot people for not doing something. And in 1951, there's quite a famous moment, and I am a I am a rabid football club Barcelona supporter for many reasons. Okay. Um, but my beloved club club was involved in this, and, and being part, being a football, uh, being a Barca supporter, is is kind of the the doorway into Catalanism. Had I had I supported some other club, then I might not have become so passionate about this. But in a game against Racing Santander. Uh, Racing the Santander in the Liga, um, it was pouring down with rain, and the whole stadium. There's a. Uh, this was the uh, Camp dels, dels Courts then, which had about forty-five thousand people. Forty-five thousand people came out of the stadium, which was on the outskirts of the city, and it was pouring down with rain. And the trams were waiting there, and famously, all the Barca, Barca fans walked into walked to their homes in town without using the the. The public transport. A few weeks later, the the soldiers finally did open fire, uh, and the, the 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 boycott was put down. But interestingly, um, the 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 government decided to bring fares down to their previous levels. So effectively, the the uh, the Catalans won. Then throughout the 50s, there wasn't very much con continuity to this. Um, some of the the con con if there was any kind of con con continuity. Um, people began starting uh, writing in Catalan. There was a, a Catalan di dictionary um, clandestinely published. There were cl clandestine mag magazines. Uh, and the, the, the real important event, um, I can't remember which year it was, was it's when the, the Catholic Church, the Catalan Catholic Church, united with the far left um, mm -hmm. under the banner of, of Catalanism. And there was a... Uh, there was a the, the 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 Abbey of Montserrat has a black famous black virgin, and they organised a uh, uh, a celebration uh, of of the black Virg virgin. A hundred thousand people went to the, to Montserrat from all over Catalonia, and a massive Catalan flag was flown from the church, and Catalan was spoken in public in a, in an official ceremony for this first time. 
Now, the power of the Catholic Church was that as the, the Franco regi regime was officially Catholic, there wasn't much that he could do about it. Right. He couldn't really yeah. take on the Catholic Church. So from then on, it's this comp combination of the working class, um, the Catalan in, in, in intelligentsia, the Spanish-speaking immigrants who are arri arriving um, from and Andalusia, often many of whom had fled fascism uh, in their own villages, so, so had a tendency to ally with the Catalans, plus the church, and churches became safe refuges for, for the resistance. Um, so you, yeah. could, you could be part of the scout group or, or be at a cookery lesson and, and be preparing your resistance to Franco. And so the church, not many people know that how important the church was um, to organizing the resistance. Then in 1963, I, I think it was the Second Vatican Council, um, um, brought in some, some innovations, talking about how um, minorities shouldn't be, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be against minorities. And this led, once again, the abbot of Montserrat to speak out in public in the Le Mans newspaper, criticizing um, the, the Frank, Francoist re regime for being fa fascist uh, and not following the, the mandates of the church. Uh, and he was, finally, he was forced to flee to France, but um, he's considered one of the great um, heroes of the movement. Aurele Escaré, actually, who was born in my, um, the suburb of Saint André, where, where I've spent most of my time. And, and then in, in 1975, Franco dies. What happens? Does that cause changes? Yeah, massive changes. Im important to remember, lots of people say, something else I talk about is, lots of people desc describe the, the Franco regime in, into the dictadura, and dura means hard, so it's the hard dictatorship, and the dicta blanda, which is, and blanda means soft, which is the soft dictatorship. But it's worth remembering that in 1974, um, people were still being executed by Garot Veal, which is, which is a, a machine that's a, a kind of vice that where people's windpipes are crushed, so a particularly cruel form of, of, of execution. And in October 1975, um, five Basque and, and, and far-left um, agitators were killed by a firing squad, and, and Franco died on November the 20th, uh, 1975. Mm -hmm. So the, the regime was pretty bad right up until the end. Don't, don't be fooled and say, oh, he was just a nice old man. man. Following that, the transition began, the transition to democracy. And it, the whole of Spain needed to change. Uh, a new constitution was written in 1978. And the system of autonomous communities came in, in 1979, which is what we're, we're living under now. And this is known as, in, in Catalonia, it's known as... as um, cafe para todos, coffee for everyone, because essentially the Basques and Catalans thought as historic nations and the, and the Galicians to a certain extent, believed that as his, historic nations, they should have a different treatment from the rest of Spain. The, the Spanish government, the democratic Spanish government now, now's uh, solution was to, to create 17 autonomous communities, which all had a high degree of autonomy. The stupid thing was places like Cantabria or La Rioja or Mur Murcia, it had never crossed their minds to have this right. degree of autonomy. Um, this was appropriate for the Basque, and it was used to water down um, Catalan and Basque sep separateness. Uh, so the, and one of the reasons why this happened is there was, obviously, Franco had been in power for nearly 40 years, and the military was waiting in the shadows so a, a two left-wing and a two separatist, separatist constitution and, and regime would, would have been under the threat of a military coup again. And in mm. fact, in 1981, there was a, an attempted coup, coup and um, Manuel Tejero and yep. his civil guards took over parliament and the tax rolled over, over Valencia. So the, the transition to democracy was nowhere near as satisfying as particularly the Can Catalans had hoped and throughout the, the the 80s and 90s however people were pretty happy with democracy um, it was a lot better than being under Franco 
Uh, and there was a kind of tacit agreement that um, the Catalonia's relationship with uh, central government would be improved. And in tw 2003, um, the Catalans uh, began arguing for a new statute of autonomy um, that would give them, would allow them to collect their own taxes uh, and then pay the central government for services that would give them an autonomous um, right. judicial system. Sorry. Right. If we just pick up on that point, uh, the, the Catalonian national tax regime was uh, biased, wasn't it? That they, they they received more than they, less than they spent. Yeah. Um, okay. This is one of the the gripes. Um, this is one of the pro independence gripes, and I, I see some some questions coming in. Um, I, I'm very clear. I, I, I I've lived here for 28 years and it took me a long time to come round to supporting an independence but pretty much from 2010 onwards when the the statute was cut so severely that that there were no benefits to it i i came out in favor of, of independence and basically throughout the whole of democracy more or less eight percent of um catalonia has lost in taxes more or less eight percent of its gdp and that means the central government taxes Catalonia, that all that money goes to Madrid, uh, and then not all of it comes back in investments in infrastructures, education, health. So whilst being per capita, the Catalans are the third highest taxpayers in Spain, in terms of ha having money reinvested, um, they're the 10th, or the, these are the last figures I had, which are from 2013, yeah. I think. They drop down to 10th out of 17. So they end up, they contribute more than average, and uh, but end up getting back less than average. Um, a good example was in the budget, the Spanish budget, budget this year. The, the Catalans make up 16% of the Spanish population and provide about 20% of its G GDP and 25% of Spain's exports. Um, in, in the budget this year, they were to get, I think it was 8.7 or 9.7 of the investment in the budget. I mean, there's a massive difference. The Catalan argument was, I mean, we're 16%, at least give us 16%, that would be fair. Uh, and, and then we would, then, the, then Catalonia would wave on, obviously everybody understands that you have to have some solidarity with poorer areas of Spain, like Andalusia and Extremadura. But ending up being poorer than they are um, doesn't make for a happy Catalonia, really. Right. So the, 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 the fight for independence, you, you've been uh, monitoring that for quite a time now. Uh, what's the current situation? OK, we've had a very, very interesting situation. Basically, the, the, the movement really took off. And people like me thought, Oh, there's no. After the 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 statute was thrown out, people like me that had been arguing in favour of federal. I, I was really pleased with the statute. In, in fact, in my first book, Going Native in Catalonia, I rather in, in, embarrassingly talk about what a great future Catalonia has, and now we're going to be happy with, in Spain. And so, and I published that in 2007. And so when it was thrown out in 2010, everybody, moderates, and I was a moderate then, moderates like me thought, there's no, there's, there's nothing that can be done about this. Uh, and so the independence movement began to gather, to gather shape, or began to take shape. It didn't really mm -hmm. gather much momentum, really, until 2012, September, September the 11th, 2012. Um, it, it lacked leadership, so lots of people were grumbling about oh, Spain's done this, Spain's done that. But in March 2012, the the ANC, the Assemblea Nacional Catalana, the Catalan National Assembly, formed as the galvanizing grassroots movement. It's a non non political movement made up of okay. of Catalan activists. In they they actually officially formed in March 2012. And what they decided to do was turn um, that year's national day on September the 11th into, into a massive demonstration calling for an independent, <coughs> an independent state. Um, before, bef in the weeks before, everybody, everybody knew something big was going to happen. 
but nobody realized how big it was going to be. I live in the center of Barcelona now, not far from Plaza, Plaza Catalunya. And previous years, you could, you could just about hear the demonstrations uh, if mm -hmm. you were lucky, or you'd have to walk a few hundred meters. But on, in September the 11th, 2012, there were 1.5 million people on the streets of Barcelona. It was right. incredible. Um, for me, it was a life-changing experience, and it, it was for many people, it was a life-changing experience. If, if 1.5 million, million people can come out on the streets peacefully, civically, um, democratically calling for democracy, it was a bit like nobody really, un, no, nobody knew that everybody else thought like this. Uh, I remember saying to a friend that day, he kind of hugged me and said, it's like Christmas this is. We used to talk about this on Christmas at Christmas lunch for half an hour and then forget about it till the next year. But um, on September 11th, 2012, 1.5 million people out on the streets, everybody, everybody realized that there was enough of a ground swell for political pressure to take place. In November 2012, Artur Mas, the then president of the, the Generalitat, which is the Catalan government, called elections and the the pro sovereignty parties won and right okay in in 2012 the 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 call really was not so much for independence but to be allowed to have a referendum on independence in on september 11th 2013 um 1.6 million people joined hands right across the the, the 400 kilometer length, length of the coastline of catalonia um, from the border with France to the border with with uh, with Valencia, that's the, the the Catalan way, uh, and uh, a proxy referendum was set up for the for um, November the 9th, uh, twenty fourteen, when all the pro sovereignty parties agreed that they would they would ask the Spanish government for a referendum. The mm -hmm. the Catalan po politicians went to Congress in. April 2014, and I think um, the the referendum was refused by 299 to 50 votes out of th there's there's 350 MPs in the in the Spanish con Congress, and it was thrown out very convincingly. The argument being that it's against the Spanish Constitution, and in order to allow there's there's a clause in the Spanish con con Constitution that talks about the, the, the sovereignty of Spain resting with all the Spanish people. And it also mentions the indissoluble unity of Spain. So for anybody to have a ref referendum on leaving Spain is considered unconstitutional. We'd argue that. Um, but the, the centralist argument is that the constitution would have to be changed. This was thrown out. Um, we decided to pass a Catalan law of consultation. So it's now no longer a referendum. It was just a consultation. That was deemed unconstitutional by the Spanish Constitutional Court um, the, the, the month before the referendum was, or the, the proxy referendum was about to take, take place. So they then changed the name and turned it into what they called a, a participatory process, which was basically a survey. So it had mm -hmm. no legal, it had no legal weight, but it had a lot of moral weight. And yes. on November, and this was also considered um, unconstitutional, even though it was a survey. There was um, right. what you, what you had to do is it's an amazing day. You had to you had to take all your documents. So you registered at the time of voting, and you gave your uh, your details to the person that was taking the vote, saying that. Yeah, you wanted to participate in this survey. They gave you the ballot paper, you filled it in, you put it in a box. And 2.45 million people, million Catalans, participated in that um, event, which had been considered illegal and was non-binding. And out of those, 1.9 million um, voted in favour of independence. Uh, and most of the rest voted it in favour of um, Catalonia becoming a state but changing its relationship with Spain. Yes. Okay. One word of warning about this, obviously, because it was illegal and it was a, it was set up by the pro-independence for, forces. Most of the unionists didn't um, didn't vote, so it wasn't considered a valid referendum. But it was a, a massive moral victory. It was a moral and and a publicity set 
success uh, around the world uh, and particularly in the media but yeah. obviously there, there needed to be a proper test so what we what the castle and pro independence parties decided to do was on tw september the 27th this year hold what they called plebiscitary elections and mm -hmm. just paul c the just paul c coalition um which is the K together for yes and the coup the far left left uh, pro independence parties stood on an independence ticket and said that if they won the elections um, they would declare the start of the the independence process this is not nothing mad like declaring independence and telling it telling everybody to get lost no they're, they're declaring the start of an independence process where negotiations would take place with spain europe various laws would be passed various structures of states such as the treasury social security systems would be set up so that if catalonia was to become independent it could rule itself or if um, it could develop a different kind of relationship with central government it would have all the structures in place um, to be a state within the state of spain right. and the the two pro-independence parties won 72 seats uh, out of 135 uh, and the independence process the declaration of independence process was made on november the 9th which was the anniversary of the proxy referendum the previous year unfortunately mm -hmm. though the anarchist anti-system coup ref refused to make the center-right candidate for the presidency arthur mass who'd basically been the from an international level the 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 public face of the the independence movement in, in the press and for other other governments because he's a center-right winger they refused to make him president because he'd been yeah. associated with um, austerity cuts and his party had been involved in some corruption scandals and they held out and held out and for three months we've been a unable to move ahead and I must admit most of us have been getting more and more depressed I yeah. think I said on Facebook um, our our um, interview was scheduled for a couple of weeks ago it, it, I partly cancelled it because I had friends coming but another reason why I cancelled it is I felt I had nothing to say, say to you, Stephen, because the, the situation was so, was so frustrating. I mean, there, there were people here, but I, I could have made more of an effort. But it was like, what am I going to say? Um, because what had happened is that the Catalan independence parties couldn't come to an agreement. Mm. And time was going to run out on at 12 o'clock Sunday night and i i record a video blog every saturday called catalonia calling on saturday i recorded a very depressing video blog, blog saying that uh, an opportunity for independence or, or or a change with spain had been missed and it was our own stupid fault so we're sitting here licking our root wounds and aren't we so pathetic um before i actually loaded the blog up to youtube news came in that a a, a a way outside candidate, Carlos Puigdemont, who's the mayor of Girona and the president of the um, Association of Municipalities for Independence, and not a well-known politician really, or not until now, um, Arthur Mas had decided to stand aside and put Carlos Puigdemont uh, up as, as candidate for the presidency, and the coup were accepting. So right. very, very quickly, um, uh, an investiture, investiture was debate was arranged for Sunday, and midnight on Sunday was the the the, the final hour. If if he hadn't been invested before midnight, uh, elections would ha would have had to be called automatically, and he was voted in by um, I think it's 80 votes to 63. And so now we have a, a new Catalan president, and I've just been watching his. Um, his speech on television, he's now accepted the role and we now have a new president here. And he's, as, he's, as he was president of the Association for Municipalities for um, Independence, um, he's as strong a bet, pro-independence right. bet, as Arthur Mas was anyway. So the, the um, fight for independence will go on now. You, you feel that the impasse, the blockage has been removed and, and with the new leader in place that uh, things can start to happen or move forward 
Yeah, I, I don't really like this term, the fight for independence, because we don't okay. consider um, um, the particularly with all the. I think it's a good idea to avoid bellicose terms, um, because right. we, we do want to do this as democratically as and as legally as possible. So the let's call it the push for independence will continue, okay. and and he's assured that this will be done within the law. Um, Catal the reason why I've lived here for, for so long is Catalonia is a very lovely place to live. Mm -hmm. It's got um, there are lovely people. It's got a lovely climate, fantastic countryside. It's got wonderful beaches, a great cafe, terrace, culture. Football um, team. So, yeah. great football team. Well, a wonderful football team, apart from anything. But. Um, one of the reasons people like me have come on board the, the independence movement is we want to make the place better. And the worst thing you can possibly do is encourage violence. I'm, I'm certainly not talking about revolution. And things like violent street demonstra demonstrations in favor of things, this would be an excuse actually to send for the, the Spanish government to send the police yeah. or the military okay. in. So, so it has to be a democratic push for it independence and yep. what we hope and one of the reasons why I, I speak to people like you and speak to anybody that will have me really is I think it's very Im important to to get the message out around the world try to come across as moderate as possible and so mm -hmm. that at some point um, there will be international moderation uh, yes. and what that international mo moderation will give us who knows it might give us a referendum so so Catalonia Catalans can actually be asked to do it but but so but as i said before the the ind independence movement is definitely pushing forward so um, it's a, a, thankfully a push for independence we wish uh, as you said this is very recent news we would have missed it uh if we'd done this last week what what's uh, your uh, take on the economist uh, piece today I actually haven't read the Economist piece, but I can okay. guess what it is. I think it's misinformed. What it's what it's talking is a quote um, by Carlos Puigdemont, the new Catalan president, mm -hmm. um, uh, talking about getting the invaders out. Now, right. this was picked up by the Spanish right, and the Economist should know better. The Economist, mm -hmm. the economist should really check its sources. Ask me, please. Um, okay, this is a quote on Twitter where Carlos Puigdemont was was quoting a recently deceased Catalan historian, and it was talking about the bon bombing of Barcelona by Mussolini's air force. Oh, right. And it was it was it was on the anniversary of the bombing of Barcelona by Mussolini's air force. So he was actually talking about getting the fascist invaders out. Uh, and, and when he was referring to fascist invaders, he was talking to Mussolini's air force and Franco's troops. We are certainly not talking about the democratic Spanish government, however many differences we might have with them. Uh, and the, the Economist gets this completely wrong. And had they taken some time, I, I haven't read the article, but I heard Carlos Puigdemont's um, reply in the investiture debate in Parliament. So, um, yeah, five, some black marks to the Economist on this, because it, it's spreading it's spreading an idea of independence, which is totally false, uh, or, or spreading an idea of, of nationalism. I don't particularly like the term nationalism. Um, I prefer the term Catalanism. But if you have to use a term, um, it is nationalism, but it's a democratic internationalist nationalism, and it's certainly not about hatred. And a push for independence yes. continues. Right. Uh, we've just... Can you can you hear right? Okay, um, that's we just seem to have lost your sound, Simon. Can you just hello, hello, hello? Oh, right, here? okay, yes, right, we're back. Yeah. Right, okay. Well, okay. we've we've been talk. Well, you've been talking for an hour, and we've uh, we've covered the agenda. I think. Yes, uh, the hind leg of, leg of off a donkey is what I can do. I think. Steve. <laughs> no, it's always enjoyable when we get together because. Uh, we we uh, share uh, our knowledge and we learn a lot from uh, you about how, what is a, a topical subject in the UK as well. With with Scotland still wanting to break away from the rest of uh, the UK, uh, that's another push for independence which continues. Um, so it's very topical, and uh, it's been brilliant to have you. 
uh, tonight and to be able to discuss it. Uh, if you'd like to say thank you to everyone, I'll switch the recording off and then we can uh, chill for a moment. Yes, well, thanks everyone for watching. Um, please follow, follow me on, on Twitter. If you disagree with me, I'm really happy to debate these things. I'm, I'm, I, I can get a bit spiky sometimes, I must admit, but I'm actually quite a nice, moderate guy. And I'm, I'm really interested to hear other people's opinions. As I said, I, I don't want to do too much publicity, but every Saturday I record a, a video blog called Catalonia, Catalonia Calling. Um, which basically is, is an update on what's happened in the week. Um, I, 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 want to, I want to be the chronicler of, of what's happening here rather than a campaigner. Um, obviously, as I explain things, I put my views across. But so thank you for, for listening to me. Thanks to Stephen for inviting, inviting me. And I hope, as, I, I hope to talk more in the future. And as I said, please do get in touch. I'm delighted to answer any questions always. I, I really enjoyed it. It's been it's been very informative, Simon, and we've had a, a good time as we usually do. I think yes, we should do one later in the year, uh, and I will add a link to your podcast to the, the blog, and uh, promote this uh, on YouTube afterwards. So thank you, everyone. We're going to stop the recording now.